what does the brain do? Now, most people know that it controls everything in the body, from our thoughts to our memories to operating all of our physical systems. But why? What's the end game and why is it important to understand when considering leadership? Ahoy, I'm Peter from Brighter Training, and this video is part of our educational neuroscience series, where learning theories and neuroscience principles are applied to business contexts, hopefully helping to create some better cultures and some better leaders. Now in this video, I'm going to explain four key goals that the brain has, and why they're vital to consider in leadership. Now, as always, if you found this video useful or thought provoking, we're grateful for any interactions via comments, likes, shares, or subscribes. A huge part of leadership is about inspiring and motivating individuals to get them to work together toward a shared vision. So it's about skill development, performance management, and activity. However, most leaders employ external behavioral psychology. So they look at the what, not the why. So we run skills training, we conduct performance reviews and introduce team building activities like personality profiles. And culturally, we stick values up on the wall and we create mission statements. Then we look for examples where people have done something that aligns with those things. Now the problem is, these approaches are from the outside in. It's effectively attempting to control behaviour and performance through a series of frameworks and scaffolds. It's like if you wanted to make your car go faster by painting stripes on it. Uh, to get the best performance, you need to create the best track, and in this case the best environment, while understanding and enhancing what's under the hood. So to truly set your team up for success, here are four things that you need to know about what the brain is trying to do. And this is important because if you get this wrong, no amount of training or policies or procedures are really going to help. Now our brain has not changed much in thousands of years, so it responds to the environment much like it did in the Stone Age. So for our own survival, the brain is hardwired to detect threat, it is highly social, it detects patterns, and it actively seeks dopamine. So a quick exploration from a leadership context. Think about the caveman day. So a really risky environment, lots of threats to our survival. So we form tribes and villages. And this allows protection and more resources and really a synergy where we benefit from the work and the ideas of others. All of which comes down to safety. And there's a whole range of philosophies about what our society would look like with or without formal civilization and government. But the key message is that we follow leaders and we join cooperatives to make us feel safe. But suppose the leadership or the environment rules by fear or changes occur which threatens our sense of safety. In that case, we lose the synergies and the benefit of a community that's built on trust and cooperation. So firstly, the brain is hardwired to detect threat. So number one at the top of our wish list is to survive, and that means avoiding threats. And we have these wonderful neurological systems that trigger a response, so you know the old fight or flight mechanism, where we prepare to run or fight or even faint when we're faced with a threat. And that response shuts down many of our higher order thinking abilities because we don't have time for slow, deliberate, rational thought in an emergency. But here's the thing, the brain constantly scans for threats and it's not only snakes or saber-toothed tigers that trigger it. Confrontation, uncertainty, inconsistency, self-doubt, risks to our social status, they all trigger the threat response, which dictates how we think and how we behave. Now in David Rocks's SCARF model, he identifies five categories which are seen as threats, including challenges to our status, not having certainty to predict the future, a lack of autonomy in the control of our environment, our sense of relatedness and belonging, and whether we look around and feel like we're treated with fairness. And if these aspects are challenged, then we often feel threatened and that therefore impacts our behavior. Next, the brain is highly social. So socializing increases survival. So let's go back to our Paleolithic lifestyle. We're out hunting with our mates and we learn how to communicate non-verbally, to read facial expressions and body language. So we know what's happening. 
There are entire systems in the brain, dubbed social networks, that help us to form communities, that help us to know who to trust and determine our place in society. In fact, our brains are so focused on it for our survival that loneliness and isolation are considered comparable to obesity, alcoholism or smoking from a health perspective. And social hurt, so being excluded or rejected, activates the same pathways as physical pain. So when we connect socially, we feel safe. That reduces the threat response, which allows activation of the parts of the brain that enable innovation and creativity and positivity. So all of those sessions where managers attempt to force collaboration or innovation via training and models, yeah, without the trust and the safety, it's probably just triggering a threat response where the creative brain shuts down and people switch to self-preservation. And self-preservation and collaboration don't really go well together in the workplace. So people may be able to act their way through those sessions, but it doesn't support genuine creativity or long-term behavioral change. Now the third thing our brain is designed to do is to detect patterns. So another way of understanding the social rules and detecting threats is to detect these patterns. And this is important. We can only pay conscious attention to a limited number of things at a time. So the more we automate, the more we free ourselves to watch out for new threats. So we look for patterns in everything. When we spot a pattern, our brain matches stimuli with memory. So no pattern means no explanation, which means more uncertainty. And uncertainty means risk. And we do this unconsciously and with everything. So the more we experience something, the more we believe it as a fact. And we generalize past experience in order to predict future ones. So facial expressions, projects that we've worked on, physical appearances and professional titles, activities that we do and social rules that we work by. So as leaders, your consistency, reliability, your presentation and your emotional regulation, even your communication skills, they all send a message that people will use to profile you. And those assessments can make them feel safe and inspired and creative, or they can trigger that threat response. So often it's not their behavior which is the problem, it's yours and the environment that you create if you don't understand the neurological needs of your team. Finally, the brain seeks dopamine. And so supporting all of this, there's a series of chemicals and hormones that make us feel good or feel bad. And we actively seek to feel good. So when we do something good, our brain rewards us with dopamine. Unfortunately, the behaviors aren't always good. And that's the trap because the brain seeks to feel good, which can sometimes lead to bad decisions and habits. Now, for example, if you eat something, you know, some comforting food, your brain releases dopamine, making you feel good. Therefore, your brain encourages you to repeat this behavior. And even though it may not be the healthiest choice for your body. So dopamine is also associated with reinforcement. So it's thought to be the chemical that motivates a person to do something repeatedly. So reward and reinforcement, they help create our personal habits. So humans gravitate toward positive experiences and they avoid negative ones. And dopamine is what drives us to create these patterns. And this is why people with low dopamine levels may be more likely to develop addictions to drugs, food, sex, or alcohol. Now in the workplace, dopamine is important because people unconsciously chase that dopamine hit. They tick things off a list or they respond to emails because they're achievable and achievement equals dopamine. But activity isn't the same as productivity. So people fill in their time with feel good behaviors that are really not the most useful, leading to rush deadlines or future conflict. And as a leader, we then set rules, we give feedback, or we conduct performance management, which then triggers that threat response, derailing the whole process. So what does this mean? In short, as a leader, it means that you need to consider the primitive drivers of human behavior. So intellectually, we understand our job, our values, and our goals. However, our brains will control our behavior, and they are not always logical. So people need social connection and genuine trust. They look for consistency, patterns, and safety. And if there's no feeling of safety, then the creative brain will shut down in preference of self-preservation. And you can't dictate a feeling of safety. It's something you need to demonstrate in order to create. And people are constantly scanning for threats. 
they can't control their threat response. So how you give feedback, organize projects or assign work or attempt to develop people could actually be seen as a threat. Even your communication comes into it. If you don't communicate clearly or set clear goals or expectations, then this causes uncertainty leading to another threat response. Effectively, many environmental and behavioral factors inhibit collaboration, inspiration, motivation, or innovation. And more patterns are repeated, the more entrenched they become. The good news is that in understanding how the brain works, we can put together strategies that allow people to connect and trust and feel safe. Now, not everyone is a leader or even wants to be, and leadership success really depends on synergy. So that's the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. And that depends on social connection and the brain being able to function optimally without distress. If you're interested in training for your leaders or teams to help them understand, explore, or apply neuroscience principles to improve culture, productivity, and performance, then drop us a line to discuss options. Our contact details can be found in the description below. Thanks again for watching and have a great day.